Okay, I know we have some people coming back in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, our subject matter expert. Uh, Dr. Ryan Mohammed is actually on uh, the council, and so we're very pleased to have him uh, representing the National Trust. Uh, he completed his PhD at the University of the West Indies, Faculty of Science and Technology in Aquatic Biology in 2019. So I am very glad to see we have great diversity in terms of the disciplines being represented uh, in the area of uh, natural and cultural heritage. He received additional training in fossil identification and preparation at the La Brea Tar Pit Museum, Los Angeles, yay, California and Museology and Museum Management at the National Heritage Museum Institute, New Delhi, during uh, 2019. And then he also did underwater heritage con conservation training with UNESCO. Um, he has worked with the IUCN, FAO, and UNESCO on policy and implementation matters of biodiversity, aquaculture, and the blue-green economy. Uh, as a Trinbagian biologist, he sees a link between conservation fauna, and culture. Um, as a matter of fact, he was happy to be part of the team uh, for the recent listing of the Main Ridge as a heritage site for Trinidad and Tobago. We heard about that earlier today, as well as UNESCO's man and the biosphere designation for Northeast Tobago. So I welcome, to welcome, Ryan. <clears throat> Thank you, Lisa. That was, I was shocked where, where you got that. That was probably Kira. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. So, like Lisa said, um, yes, I am a member of the National Trust of Trinidad and Pago Council um, on the Natural Her on the Landmarks Committee with particular focus with natural sites. And today, uh, on this afternoon session, I have been given the daunting task of recreating the momentum from this morning. Okay, so we see that it, our team for our uh, meeting today is keeping our heritage above water, and with all things that happen on land, we see that link going back to water. So our first presenter for today's session, it will be uh, on the theme of protecting our natural heritage through mitigation and adaptation, would be Prof. David Guggenheim, and he'll be speaking to us on the, hold on, I know I have my notes here. <gasps> Light bulb moment. The in, 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 in extricable relationship of historic preservation and coastal conservation, building incentives to protect and restore both. Okay, so Dr. Um, Prof. Goenheim is an adjunct professor at John Hopkins University. He has done extensive work on coral reefs in Cuba, and this has led to his recent book, congratulations on your recent book, on remarkable reefs in Co Cuba as well. So without further ado, your presentation. So, Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, um, and my sincere thanks to Lisa Craig, the Craig Group, the National Trust, the University of Florida, the U.S. Embassy, the Ministry of Planning and Development, and so many others, and all of you um, as well. I've learned a lot from all of you. This is my second visit to Trinidad and Tobago, and your legendary hospitality is greatly appreciated. I, I really love it here. Um, I have felt like a fish out of water, pun intended, um, in past uh, conferences, because I was really the only marine biologist in the room, and the rest were historic preservationists. But now I have company, and, <clears throat> and this is great. Uh, Dr. Muhammad is one, um, Jalaluddin Khan in the audience is, is another. Um, so we're a force, so beware. Um, uh, anyway, let's see if I can 
send this in the right direction. You know, I'm here because there is an inextricable link between natural or historical preservation and natural preservation and the heritage, both uh, of the natural world and the built world and the human world above water. Um, and these are scenes from Cuba, the famous Moro on the water, um, near Vinales, uh, nature and human existence and heritage are just inextricably linked, both culturally and, um, and physically and uh, naturally. So this is my best friend, Coral. Um, Coral is, uh, the, what's pictured is Acropora palmata, or Elkhorn coral, one of the most important reef building corals in the Caribbean. So the quiz for today, actually there's another quiz later, uh, is animal, mineral, or vegetable? Okay, who thinks it's an animal? Okay, mineral? Mm, uh, vegetable? Well, you're all right. It's a trick question. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of everything. I'm, most people would say, most scientists would say it's an animal. It's a colonial animal, but it secretes a calcium carbonate um, structure, so that's the mineral, and it houses, uh, at least the Caribbean corals, an algae, uh, which is symbiotic. It generates sugars, and in return, it gets a home. So when you put them all together, you can kind of see the polyps, the individual polyps in this uh, wonderful Elkhorn coral. Well, on a good day, this is what I drive to work. <laughs> and I was on an expedition with Greenpeace in the Bering Sea to visit the two largest underwater canyons in the world, which are both in the Bering Sea, uh, Zemchug being basically twice the size of the Grand Canyon. And I didn't get down to the bottom. I got to about 2,000 feet and saw this. The last place you'd expect to see a coral in the Bering Sea, but we've discovered that there are deep water, cold water corals all around the world. <clears throat> Coral is the oldest living animal on the planet. It is, can live to be 4,000 years old, meaning it's witness to the Bronze Age, the completion of Stonehenge, the reign of the pharaohs of Egypt, the birth of Christ, and the finale of Breaking Bad, <laughs> and still be alive. That's old. So why do we care? You know, there aren't that many species of corals, um, maybe a thousand or so, but they can support up to nine million other species. Maybe a quarter of all marine species depend on coral reefs. They're home to a quarter of the fish species that we know. And they generate an enormous amount of money to the global economy, maybe $170 billion a year for tourism and food and coastal protection. More than half of new cancer drug research is focused on marine life. And as I mentioned briefly just a moment ago, coastal protection. Very, very important um, asset because coral reefs can absorb an incredible 97% of wave energy. Uh, and an, achieve an 84% average total wave height reduction. So coral reefs are very important for coastal protection. And when it comes to the equation of whether to build seawalls or to restore coral reefs, it's a no-brainer. Uh, restoring coral reefs is roughly one fifteenth of the cost of building gray infrastructure to protect coastlines. There was a study done by World Resources Institute and around the Caribbean, and they did some work here, but the, uh, this particular report was done in Belize, and they looked at the economic value of corals and mangroves, and 
the economic value of those natural assets to coastal protection, shoreline protection, is greater than the value for tourism and recreation and fisheries combined. So that is a valuable asset um, for a uh, coastal community, an island nation especially. So if you took all the corals in the world, they would fit inside the state of Texas. That's all we've got, less than 1% of our planet's surface, of the oceans. Now, people in Texas would say, hey, Texas is big. Uh, but, you know, put that aside. That's a very small number. Um, that's what we're highly dependent on. So our corals are truly precious. But what's happening, and I have to warn you, uh, like Jeff yesterday, I will be depressing you all, but I promise by the end, I'll bring you back. Um, but this is what I saw, or I'm sorry, this is what we see in the IUCN red list of endangered species. Look at the slope of that line for corals compared to other species. They're dying off very, very quickly. So, um, Dr. Havasair, I'm so tempted to call you Dr. J because I'm a Philadelphia native. Uh, I've seen his Lincoln Continental with the, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Um, but education, experiential education is so important and that's why I'm doing what I do. I went to Sea Camp, a uh, marine science camp in the Florida Keys, where they would basically throw you in the water and you couldn't do anything else but learn. And um, it was ama so amazing to me. I went back for eight summers to teach there as well. And um, this is what I saw. Oh, here are the Florida Keys, in case you don't know where they are. That's the uh, southern tip of Florida. This is what I saw. Look at that beautiful Elkhorn coral. It goes on forever. But 10 years later, this is what it looked like, covered with algae. 10 years later, 10 years later, and in 2014, you can barely tell there was even a reef there. It's devastating. It's heartbreaking to me because this is what gave me the inspiration to do what I do. So people like me dream of, I, I bet you didn't expect to see a DeLorean in my presentation. <laughs> you know, we dream of time machines, and I'm sure you do too, in terms of um, the built environment. To go back, to see those magnificent things again, and to do something uh, to change the future. Well, I found my time machine. It was a 1953 Dodge, or is that a Buick? I don't know. The Cubans know our cars better than we do, so I'll have to ask a Cuban friend. But Cuba came to my emotional rescue. Here's what I saw. Do we have any audio? Thank you. It's an Elkhorn coral that goes on for 30 miles as healthy as I saw when I went to sea camp, some, some healthier. And where you see corals, you see fish and so many other species that depend on them. It was, oh, well, there's a chapter in my book called OMG, I Thought You Were Dead. <laughs> um, but this is Cuba and it, I've been working there for more than 20 years now, and you can see some of the reasons why. This is brain coral, for obvious reasons. Look at that, just incredibly healthy. So if you put them side by side, <clears throat> um, it's a fair comparison. 1975, Florida Keys, 2015, Jardines de la Reina in the southern part of Cuba. Uh, so it really is a living time machine and a living laboratory so that we can go 
and study what a real coral reef looks like with all of its components. It's an incredible place to do science, which we are doing collaboratively with our Cuban counterparts. So that is what I explore in the book. Why are Cuba's reefs so healthy? And there are actually quite a few reasons for that and interesting reasons. We mostly, I think the public mostly hears about <clears throat> climate change and coral bleaching as a result of warm water. Those algae that I mentioned, zooxanthellae, it's too hot for them, they disappear. So you're looking at coral that may still be alive, but it's in a weakened, vulnerable condition. It can go back and become healthy again, but if it extends too long, those corals die. And that happened, unfortunately, in the Great Barrier Reef. They had unprecedented back-to-back -back warming events, 2016, 2017, and it was estimated they lost half of the corals since 1995. Um, this is a place that's far offshore and protected, but that's the power of climate change. If you haven't already seen it, Chasing Coral, done by a friend of mine, uh, colleague Jeff Orlowski, uh, is on Netflix. It's, uh, it's a great documentary that documents this. Yes, a bit depressing, but also quite encouraging and very interesting. But there's more to the story than climate change. I describe corals as sort of princess in the pea. They're very fussy. They pretty much hate everything we do. Um, and the thing we forget about is that there are global stressors like climate change, like uh, ocean acidification, but there are also local things that we have control over, that we can do, but some of them aren't obvious nutrient pollution, overfishing, destructive fishing practices, sedimentation, diseases. So in the United States history, back in the 50s and early 60s, we had rivers catching fire. This is the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. And this is what we saw, toxic waste going into our rivers and waterways. It was disastrous. And a Republican by the name of Richard Nixon signed into law a series of environmental laws that still exist. He established the Environmental Protection Agency, some of the most monumental environmental laws in history. Um, and one of those was the Clean Water Act, and it worked. It's done a great job at cleaning up those point sources, pipes, and other effluent of toxic materials going into our rivers. But what the Clean Water Act did not anticipate was another kind of pollution. And that's pollution that doesn't come from pipes. So here's quiz number two. What is the number one irrigated crop in the United States? I would say corn, soybean, sorghum. What's that? Almonds, oh my. Oh, because they use a lot of water. Yes, turf grass. Ah, yes, you read my book. Um, you cheated, you cheated. Um, turf grass, 40 million acres of the land in the continental US have some form of lawn. We love our lawns. This comes from British heritage. And here's a quote from an 1870 book by Frank Scott. A smooth, closely shaven surface of grass is by far the most essential element of beauty on the grounds of a suburban house. And that caught on big time. And what do we do? We fertilize our lawns. So this is from New Jersey, a great ad. If you use too much fertilizer on your lawn, you might as well fertilize the stream. All that runoff 
people use too much fertilizer because they want their lawn to be greener than their neighbors. All that fertilizer runs off into streams and it does the same thing in rivers or in the oceans where those rivers ultimately go that it does on your lawn. It stimulates the growth of algae in the water and that algae can choke uh, marine life, including corals. I was lecturing to some kids in Ohio and I said, literally what you do in your backyard can affect the oceans. And in Cuba, not so many lawns. Uh, of course, big ag, industrial agriculture, plays an even greater role in nutrient pollution. And again, Clean Water Act, this is non-point solution. This is or it's pollution. This is coming from all over, much more difficult to manage. Same problem, nutrient runoff. So if you, oh, and other sources of fertilizer as well. So if you look at the continental United States, that big pink patch in the middle, even a little piece of Canada, which isn't shown there, drains into the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico, 44%. And if you go out there, this is what you see. All that nutrient pollution, that algae, and that algae ultimately dies and bacteria go to work on it to decompose it. And that process uses oxygen. So at the mouth of the Mississippi, there is a dead zone devoid of oxygen where nothing can live. It's the size of the state of New Jersey. It's huge. But if the state of New Jersey were a dead zone, we'd probably do something about it, despite the grief that New Jersey gets. So all those nutrients took hold very, very quickly. 1985, um, those reefs were slimed um, by algae smothered. But there was something else going on as well, which I'll talk about in a moment. But first, we have to go to the Soviet Union, unfortunately. Um, when the Soviet Union pulled out of Cuba, the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, Cuba was suddenly without any resources, any energy, any support. Their GDP decreased by 35%. People were hungry, lost uh, up to 25%, I think, of their, of their weight. Uh, it was a brutal existence called the uh, euphemism, the special period. Many of us had never heard about the suffering that went on in the 1990s in Cuba. Um, and they had no oil, so they had to result to, it, to some very unusual contraptions um, for public transportation to save oil. This will hold about 110 passengers instead of buses and taxis. Um, and this is the equivalent of uh, Julia Child in the United States, a uh, cooking program on TV, and she was teaching people how to make ropa vieja, shredded beef, a traditional Cuban dish, using banana peels. Um, you know, this is, this is where, this is how serious it got. But, oh, and at the same time, if you killed a cow, it was a 25-year uh, sentence in prison, you know, and you know, people were desperate. But they were farming without fertilizer. And this is uh, part of the story of the difference between Cuba and the United States at that time. They couldn't afford fertilizer. They no longer received it from the Soviet Union. So roughly 70% of Cuba was practicing organic farming. This is actually a present day photo. Um, they are actually still farming this way, and still much of it organic. So our theory was no nutrient pollution, the rivers must be much cleaner. But this was all speculation. Cuba has a lack of basic research because of a lack of resources. But recently, 
Um, it's been uh, studied thanks to University of Vermont scientists. We now know that the nutrient load of these rivers is much lower than our rivers, roughly a quarter or less of the Mississippi, for example, in some areas. Very low nutrients, which may be very responsible, which we believe is almost uh, certainly responsible for helping coral reefs. Um, this is, by the way, um, called an organoponico. Uh, these are basically urban organic farms where if you want the best produce, you go there. I had to check the color on my camera to make sure this was accurate, and it is. That's the good stuff. That's really um, beautiful. So something else was going on at the same time in Cuba, uh, or I'm sorry, in the Caribbean. When all those corals died, in 1983, there was perhaps, it's been described as the largest underwater pandemic in history. This black spiny sea urchin, some of you may have seen if you're, um, if you're divers or snorkelers, we hated these things because we'd run into them and we'd get their spines, you couldn't pull the spines out. And now we realize um, this die off basically killed 90 something percent of this population. Now we realize we lost a treasure because these guys go to work on that algae and keep those corals clean. So we lost those in almost the blink of an eye, probably due to a virus that was brought over in, uh, by a ship in the Panama Canal. So this is a report that was done several years ago that showed, sadly, we've lost about 50% of the corals in the Caribbean since 1970. And the question is, why is there a fish in a net on the cover instead of a big coral reef? Uh, that is a parrotfish, beautiful fish. It has a beak because it munches on coral, which you'd think is a bad thing. But what it does is it munches on the algae-infested uh, coral. Infest may be too strong a word, but the algae-covered coral. So it actually eats algae. Um, and let me show you a quick video. There is a parrotfish enjoying a wonderful meal of algae. There is the stoplight. Look how beautiful they are. You can see why they're called parrotfish. Now wait for it. Wait for it. There we go. Okay. I'm a biologist. I'm allowed to show you these things. There we go, just in case you missed it the first time. Okay. So let me read from the book. It is common to see parrotfish swimming about, nonchalantly emitting a contrail of white sand from their anus, the end product of coral as it is pulverized, passing through their digestive system. That sandy fish poop makes up a substantial part of the sandy halo surrounding reefs. So fair warning, if you find yourself scuba diving, and kneeling in the sand near a coral reef, it may well have traveled through the gut and anus of a parrotfish to get there. Feel honored. <laughs> They're really incredible fish, but the problem is we're eating them. They're very common, especially in Jamaica. This is what you see in the fish market in the US Virgin Islands. These are the kids of a fisherman that I know very well. And look how small those fish are as well. And these kids are growing up thinking these are big fish. And that's another problem, this issue of shifting baselines. Maybe what I saw in 1975 wasn't anything compared to what was there 100 years before. You know, we all set our own baselines. But fish are so important and we still manage them like corn, as if we harvest this crop from the ocean, maximum sustainable yield, same 
process his managing uh, crops on the field, on the agricultural field. But fish are part of the ecosystem. We just saw the parrotfish. They have jobs to do. They're part of the fabric. And when we take them out, we're taking out part of the ecosystem. And that's killing corals. That's why overfishing is so important. But our attitude still seems to be, going back to the 1800s, this is a, a smart guy, said all fisheries are inexhaustible. Any attempt to regulate these fisheries would, would be useless. But that made sense. In his day, fishing for cod off of New England looked like this. Cod would, I think, sometimes literally jump into the boat. And this is the salt fish that's so important for the Caribbean. And this is what we did to them. That population crashed and it has never recovered. The great cod fishery. Um, it's been said that his, historically overfishing uh, causes ecological extinction and precedes all other human disturbance, including climate change. This is how many scientists feel about what overfishing is doing to our ecosystems. In contrast, this is a Cuban fishing vessel, part of the commercial fishing fleet. They fish with hook and line, obviously much less impact. They banned trawling, scraping the bottom for fish in the early 2000s. I want to talk for a moment about the Everglades. I was co-chair of the Everglades Coalition many moons ago. It's one of my favorite places on the planet. And this is what it used to look like. Slow moving water, barely perceptible. They call it the river of grass. And through all these wetlands, that water would be crystal clear and clean. That's what wetlands do for you. By the time it reaches these beautiful estuaries, Rookery Bay being one of my favorites, which depend on that delicate balance of fresh and salt water. And we didn't like wetlands very much. It was a stinking swamp full of reptiles and nasty stuff. So we decided to change the Everglades, drain that bloody swamp. And we did a great job of it. And this is what the Everglades looks like today. It's actually one of the most remarkable engineering feats ever accomplished. But the problem is they underestimated by far the number of human beings that would eventually move to Florida and continue to move. So they are replumbing the Everglades and it's one of the largest environmental restoration projects in history. But there's, there's interesting dimensions to this. This is my testimony to Congress back in 2000 to pass the legislation. And I said, ironically, we've turned fresh water into a pollutant at a time that we need that fresh water. And what I'm talking about is all the paved, impermeable, uh, surfaces that we've created. We've taken that slow water and we've turned it into fast water. So this is a graph of salinity in Rookery Bay. Now, ignore that part where there's no data, but you can see where I've circled it, that salinity drops to almost fresh water and that's lethal to many of the organisms in our estuaries. This is Naples Bay some of the most expensive real estate you'll find in the world, that's a dead bay. I've been at the bottom. Um, all that fresh water, that's, a, that's supposed to be an estuary. There's nothing living there. I found a couple starfish. I mean, I like starfish, but you know. But my point is these natural flowways are so important. We should not be altering them. We should not be building infrastructure. Mother Nature knows how to drain the land um, and keep herself alive uh, in the process. Keep that water, keep those natural flowways there and that water will stay much slower. It will reduce flooding and reduce the need to build gray infrastructure. Just as contrast in Cuba, 
This is Zapata Swamp. It's known as the Cuban Everglades. No dams, no canals. Another issue is coral diseases. This is very serious right now um, going on, and we're finding that there is a direct link between humans and some of these diseases, some possibly coming from ships uh, and some coming from human uh, waste, white pox, coming from... Uh, you know, basically, it wasn't a good idea to build septic tanks in limestone in the Florida Keys, a very porous material, and human waste is linked with white pox disease, which is killing corals. So uh, part of the Everglades restoration is building one of the longest sewer systems in history along the Florida Keys, um, and hopefully that will reduce that nutrient waste. So again, as I go along, I'm, I'm emphasizing the fact that we can control many of these things that are killing corals, which are our defense uh, in, um, in coastline protection, in sea level rise. Mangroves are also incredibly important. Um, Here's a, an example in China of all of these mature mangroves as coastline defense. They're incredibly hardy, but we are killing them. Uh, globally, between 20 and 35 percent. Southwest Florida, I shall shame for 50 to 60 percent. Some areas, 99 percent. And it could be argued that in Fort Myers, um, had they left mangrove ecosystems intact instead of getting rid of them all, that the damage could have been at some level mitigated by the presence of a natural defense. And it's pretty awful what happened there. And as it turns out, Ian, that, didn't, that slide didn't quite work, did it? Um, but Ian is uh, one of the, the fourth most expensive, uh, costly hurricanes uh, in history. And of the top 10, all but one occurred in the last 19 years. So I'm going to go back to this slide and just remind you that that also includes mangroves. So corals and mangroves. So keeping our shorelines protected. Talk very briefly about tourism. Um, you know, tourism is, is part of this equation and, and it cuts both ways. But I talk about tourism because it's one of the most critical parts, uh, according to the IUCN, of habitat loss in the Caribbean. And the mass tourism model has been pretty much proven a failure. So we've lost about 40% of our mangroves in the Caribbean um, in the past 25 years, not all due to uh, tourism. Uh, this is Cancun, perhaps the poster child of the mass tourism model in, in Havana. I was trying to translate spring break very unsuccessfully. Uh, if anybody can help me uh, translate that into Spanish, that would be helpful. But, you know, you've got, so you've not a, got to know the context. Cruise tourism, 13 times less revenue than uh, traditional tourism. And what it does to the culture of a community is, um, goes without saying. And the problem is there's great commoditization of tourism in the Caribbean, meaning you're just looking for the best deal. You want sun and surf, you may stay at an all-inclusive, and the culture doesn't matter. You don't go into town, you have no incentive. Um, and that's commoditization of tourism. Uh, you go on and Google, you know, Cancun, and you can see the third result, find cheap hotels. That's, people are, that's what people are looking for. And maybe at the expense of looking for tourism, so, or uh, culture. So in the Caribbean, it's called leakage, meaning that 80% of the dollar that comes into the Caribbean leaves the Caribbean for tourism. 
goes to multinational corporations. Sorry, Hyatt. Um, <laughs> didn't mean to insult you. But, um, you know, when, when I was last here, I saw the Hilton on Tobago, and it had just been built, and it was very controversial because there were many jobs promised to the local populations. Uh, that didn't pan out. Um, they blocked the best beach off from the locals, and it was an all-inclusive, so people didn't go into town. It failed in every imaginable way. I hope it's better now. I don't know. Somebody will have to tell me. Um, in Cuba, you know, Cuba still has its cultural heritage. It's held on to its identity. And I, the same can be said for Trinidad and Tobago. It hasn't become commoditized. We've worked uh, in Cuba and this delightful place that nobody knows about, the Isle of Youth, the seventh largest island in the West Indies, larger than all of those uh, islands combined. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. We work in a small town called Cocodrilo. This is the southern half of the island, absolutely beautiful. But this is a very poor community, 50% unemployment, and they are fishing illegally in a protected area because they have no choice. They have to feed their family. Young boy learning to drive. Um, and, you know, just like Trinidad, Cuba has an advantage. And visitors will pay a premium for an authentic experience. That's been my experience bringing visitors to Cuba. It's... it's you know, keeping your cultural identity means more money in tourism. And what we've been trying to help the Cubans do is develop small-scale tourism that really works at a community level, keeps money in that community, and retains that authenticity and doesn't pave over it with huge hotels. Again, sorry, Hyatt. This is the first bed and breakfast in Cocodrilo, and it's also the first dive center. Uh, I was the first American to sleep there, and my suggestion was you should have screens uh, on the windows because I donated quite a bit of blood uh, to the local insect population. Um, so if we go back to this, the local threats and the global threats, there is scientific evidence, compelling, that what we do locally has an enormous effect at the global level. Essentially, we can save corals, we can save mangroves, we can make these corals more resilient to the effects of climate change. And that is really important in an era where we feel helpless. Here's an example, Florida yards and neighborhoods teaching people how to replant with native vegetation. You don't have to water it, it, it lives there. You know, it, it's happy as it is. But again, we're just buying time. Uh, eventually, as we heard this morning, we're gonna lose a lot of corals by the end of the century. You can see that where the line is, we may lose 70 to 90% by the end of this century as the temperatures increase. Um, there's a lot of work going on, selective breeding, genetic modification, uh, coral restoration, um, and so on. And so another message that's important is something very successful are marine protected areas. Um, there are not many here, and yet these are some of the most important tools in the tool bag to protect coral reefs and mangroves. Um, and if you look in the United States, I'm sorry, this clicker is just not working too well. Um, the key word is no take, no fishing. Don't take anything out, no extractive use, and the results are breathtaking as a result of that. Sorry. Um, and again, resilience. 
these ecosystems, even if degraded, can come back very quickly. And it's an insurance policy. You're protecting other parts of the ecosystem, like these beautiful frigate birds. Um, I will briefly mention, sorry. How much time am I out? OK, perfect. Um, we're working on a project with a company called Blue Green Future, which is headed by um, a guy who used to, uh, well, is uh, on sabbatical 25 years at the International Monetary Fund. So that's an unlikely combination. But we're working uh, on a project in Florida. There's Rookery Bay again. Uh, and the idea is to restore Rookery Bay, but to do it for free, or at least to do it for less money. And the model comes from, I'm sorry, it's more poop, uh, whale poop. Uh, at least this is how it started. Now, if you can imagine the International Monetary Fund releasing a paper on whale poop, um, our partners, Ralph Shami, uh, the scientist there, and he did a study on whale poop. And this isn't new, but it has to do with what's called the uh, uh, carbon pump in the ocean. Whales fertilize the open ocean where you don't have a lot of nutrients. That sequesters carbon, it stimulates algae, sequesters carbon, and that's worth a lot of money. The price of carbon has really increased. So he did a calculation that said that whale could be worth $3 million, just one whale. And imagine the number of whales that used to be in the ocean. Fascinating. Uh, he spoke at the um, uh, International TED meeting in Vancouver this year, along with Al Gore and Elon Musk and all of those guys. Um, so basically, the idea is taking carbon from a cost, like restoring ecosystems, or paying for carbon when you get on an airplane or something like that, and turning it from a cost, and this is the magic of working for the International Monetary Fund, into an investment, where you would invest, for the first time, this is why Florida is interested, outside funds investing in public lands. And not owning them, but basically paying for their services. And so basically, the economics are baked into this. And this approach is different because it provides for private investment. Um, again, no private ownership of these lands. It, again, takes carbon from a cost to an investment so if I invest money, I could get a return on Trinidad's mangroves, you know. And in return, no new taxes, you reduce the cost of restoration, and no new government regulations. It's really an interesting process that they're implementing around the world right now. We think it's ideal for Florida, and it's possibly something that would be of interest here. I think it's, um, it, you know, in terms of uh, restoring um, mangroves and other communities, again, made possible because of the price of carbon. And also there are benefits that accrue locally. So the local communities also benefit from this. So there's a lot of blue carbon projects out there. And I want to just say this one's different. This is, this is uh, based on a very different economic model. So this gives me a lot of confidence and optimism. And I want to close just by a shout out to Dr. J uh, on education and the importance of that and, um, and the future of our, you know, uh, the, you know, the importance of the next generation um, so I've been traveling to all 50 states in the United States to talk to kids about the oceans and careers in science. Um, it's supposed to advance by itself, but it seems stuck. There we go. 
Um, so from Alaska to the Virgin Islands to um, the middle of Kansas, Georgia, even in Cuba, which isn't in the United States, but doing joint programs in Cuba. And even my students, who I call the new ocean doctors. Um, but I think the next generation is ready to take their turn at the helm. And I have every confidence that they can navigate us to a new and bright future. So I thank you very much for your time. Okay, we'd like to open the floor for questions. We'll take um, a maximum of four questions. I want to encourage our youth to ask some questions as well to uh, so four people from the floor and we'll also entertain online questions. It's a community. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, okay. Ho ho Um, hi everyone. Concerning the coral reefs and tourism, how does the government um, control the amount of coral that is taken away by individuals, so like putting fish tanks and things at home? How do they go about controlling that situation? Um, the government's role it works at many different levels. The United States is is a bit strange because we have no, uh, we, we basically have 13 maybe more agencies managing the oceans. So it's not easy. But one of the things, you, you heard me talk about marine protected areas, that's incredibly important. That's mostly overseen by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Those can be very controversial. Nobody wants to be told they can't fish in their favorite fishing spot. But um, in the end, uh, I think a lot of uh, fishermen who, who fish for their livelihood now understand you can have more fish because um, there's something called the spillover effect where you have a protected area, fish do very well, and they spill over. Uh, outside, so they hang out around outside the, the border of that protected area. Um, National Marine Fisheries Service manages fish populations. Well, actually, they manage people. I've been told that fish, fisheries management is about managing people. Um, uh, but all the fisheries regulations, what, you, what size limits are, the number that you can take per day, uh, applies to both sport fishing and commercial fishing. Um, you know, it's, it's a complex equation. Then you get, get into pollution, you get into um, coastal management. Because you saw Rookery Bay, all of the, well, I shouldn't say all, but many, if not most, of the commercially important species start their lives there. Grouper, for example, very popular fish. Uh, they're born and raised, basically, they raise themselves in estuaries. And then they swim 150 miles offshore where they're fished. And then they uh, reproduce out there. It's really quite an amazing thing. But if we lose those coastal resources, uh, which are managed by a number of agencies, we're losing those fish, we're losing reef fish, and so on. So I think the idea <clears throat> is that we're evolving from managing one species at a time to recognizing that we have to manage entire ecosystems, which means that the Florida Everglades, if you've been to Disney World or if you've been to Fort Lauderdale, you've been in the Everglades. You may have not realized it. It's not just the park. It's all of those ecosystems together that support one another um, into the larger, greater ecosystem. And the same in the oceans. You need this, the, the, I call it the ugly and the ordinary. Seagrasses and, and muddy bottoms and all of the rest and poop. You need all of that together to 
save coral reefs. Just a quick comment again, congratulations on your tech presentation, making it very literal. I just want to support that keeping history above water is that we talk in the room about heritage history, human history, but we have the whole responsibility of natural history. Yes. And this is what, as heritage professionals, don't see ourselves as human heritage, but see natural history as custodian and stewards of the environment. We are only 500 years as a civilization in the West. You know, let's see what the next 500 years are going to be moving forward and how we take responsibility of being stewards and managers. And if we're going to, the, the sea level rise is coming, it's going to happen. Let's move forward in terms of making sure we have the management system to take stewards and responsibility. Do you see with sea level rise and what we heard this morning, um, we're going to get mass wipeout, especially in the context of this conference on the Caribbean, a mass wipeout of coral reefs will, or coral reefs will evolve, you know, um, in some, some regions and disappear in the next time. I, you know, I've read some literature on that, but the, I don't think coral reefs, unless the sea level rise is massive, I think coral reefs are resilient enough so that sea level rise won't be as much of an issue. I've been 300 feet down in a sub off of the, in the Gulf of Mexico and could see the surface. Uh, so if the water quality is good, they're gonna get sunlight for those algae that need the sunlight, uh, they're photosynthetic, and they'll be okay. But if that water's hot, you know, that's, that's gonna be a big problem. But think about this. Those reefs in Cuba are sitting in the same hot water as the reefs in the United States and everywhere else, just 90 miles away. And look at the contrast. And that, again, is, is hope that we can um, do the right thing. And I just wanted to amplify your message. You know, we've, I've always had the problem that just because you can't see beneath the surface, most of us, you know, we haven't been diving and certainly not in submarines, um, it doesn't mean that it's not part of our heritage. You know, what we see as the quality of the oceans deteriorates, we may not ever see that from the surface. And there are, you know, it is part of our heritage. And it, there's, you know, human heritage as well, archaeological resources that are, are down there as well. So it's, it's you know, it's a great point, Jalala. That. David, I've got um, an online question and... Uh, it's pretty interesting. It's from a, a colleague of ours, uh, Kim and I know, in Nantucket. So, um, could carbon credits be used as a financing mechanism to move buildings away from the shoreline? A property owner would volunteer to remove their structure from property at risk from erosion flooding due to climate change and receive carbon credits that they could sell, uh, being compensated for that loss of use. I, what do you think of that? I love that. Okay, um, so that's apparently uh, what we're uh, going to do in Nantucket, Kim. Th so. <laughs> the idea, yeah, the idea is um, that you're replacing what was there with uh, carbon, something that is sequestering carbon uh, from the atmosphere. So I did, uh, I committed heresy in Florida. Um, I was speaking, believe it or not, to a, a whole room full of construction lawyers in Florida. And I had the audacity to suggest, doesn't Florida have enough golf courses? <laughs> like, do you really need to build another golf course in Florida? And I thought I was gonna have notebooks hurled at me and, you know, get kicked out of the room. They agreed. They agreed the economics of golf has changed and they're losing money and they said wow if we converted those golf courses into nature preserves and could get carbon credits for it you know in the way that i was showing have people invest then that could be a thing that could work so you know the economics of it need to be analyzed more carefully but uh 
this is certainly in the realm of possibility. I love the idea. Can I? Hello? Hey. Yeah. Dr. I, J. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to point out, too, uh, thank you. Brilliant presentation. Very, very thank much you. appreciated. I do think also with the climate change issues that we're discussing here, it should be pointed out the damage caused by major storms and the increasing number and, and, and ferocity of, yep. of major storms, as well as earthquakes and tsunamis. We have done a study in Bonaire where we were able to document four, four major tsunami events that wow. hit Bonaire. But each time what's happening with the tsunami, it's wiping out the coral reef, yeah. even some of the archaeological sites. And that's affecting the indigenous populations who 50% of their diet is dependent on these reefs. So you're getting these periods of, of just decimating the subsistence base in, in a day with, with a tsunami event kind of thing. Mm -hmm. so, and I would also like to say civilization has been here far longer than 500 years. I just want to make sure you're, you're clear on that one. But uh, I think that that also in our discussions here, that's also, uh, your nutrient thing is absolutely, seems right on. But those are also big factors. Absolutely. And, and one of the things to remember is, you know, corals have survived those events for, you know, millennia, as well as hurricanes. Um, but when we add all these other stressors, and we, now we have monstrous hurricanes, um, it changes the equation. But also, what the, I wanted to mention something that you mentioned yesterday, uh, toxic algae blooms. Um, I lived in Naples, Florida. One night, I was coughing, uh, almost went to the emergency room, and it turns out there was a red tide. The window was open, and that stuff really is as toxic as you say. It killed hundreds of manatees. There was one recently that killed 10% of the manatee population in Florida. Um, nutrient pollution. You know, this is, this is the culprit here. So, so many of these, these things that uh, we're facing in the ocean, if we can control the runoff from sewage, from agriculture, and our backyards, you know, that may be, uh, you know, combined with, you know, a lack of overfishing, you know, we're, we're saving our, our heritage, natural and cultural. Okay, we'll have one quick question, last question from this young lady. Make it quick yeah. before we... Thank you for the fantastic presentation. Um, sitting here listening to everything is interesting coming from Montserrat because most of the issues that we're facing as it relates to climate change have been caused by a volcano, especially ah. as it relates to coral. So my question to you, does coral have the ability to adapt to climate change? Because we've seen that some of the coral in Montreal is actually coming back even after all of the ash fall and the pyroclastic flows, etc. cetera. Um, they're doing a lot of selective breeding right now in Florida, which basically, you know, I'm not a geneticist, but that would suggest that those genes exist, that some corals are more thermally tolerant. So, uh, so there is an adaptation argument to be made there. Um, there was another part of your question. Um, Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the ash fall is, a, is an issue because it's similar to sedimentation. In Mexico, I saw reefs covered with sediment from uh, deforestation happening 100 miles away upriver. Um, so that can be an issue. But the, um, the issue is, can they adapt? I, I think the evidence is strong from the Cuban example that they can be resilient, uh, which buys them time and perhaps over time adapt better where those good genes express themselves. But, um, uh, you know, again, that's, those are the things we can control all those, those issues that I mentioned. Have you ever compared Cuba to, for instance, what the coral in Cuba may have? 
in, in, genetically and in terms of the comparison, no. I don't know that that research has been done yet, but I, I know it's ongoing right now. And the last thing I'll say, because I'm way over, and I apologize to especially you, um, is that I was just in Cuba just over a week ago, and my colleague told me they just completed a coral reef survey around the island, which shows that local factors are actually more important than climate change when they do the analysis. So, you know, think about that because we're hearing the opposite. Our gut tells us it's the opposite, but Cuba is a really interesting example. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, David, for that. Well, you gener definitely generated the momentum. Okay, so our second presenter follows on the heels of biodiversity and will address mechanisms of build, building resilience for historic and natural resources. Philip, Philip Todd is a project development coordinator for the Atlantic Reef Makers. Uh, his academic training includes biology and environmental studies, but also has practical knowledge in environmental and policy development. So he has 25 years of experience in this field. I now pass the floor on to Philip. Good afternoon. I am humbled uh, to be included with all these great speakers and to be a part of your conference here and speaking with you about climate change and this resilient structure on our property in um, New uh, Brunswick County, North Carolina. This has become near and dear to my heart over the past five years. The site that we're going to speak about is located in North Carolina, which is located about halfway between uh, it's the east coast of the United States, halfway between New York and Florida. Uh, the project area in particular is located in the southeast corner of North Carolina. We have Orton Plantation to the north of the property, which is a historic rice plantation and garden. To the south, we have a marine, uh, military installation. And so it's situated right there on the Cape Fear River. The area in yellow is a shipping channel that connects the Port of Wilmington with the Atlantic Ocean at Southport, North Carolina. And it's about 25 miles from inland down to the mouth of the Cape Fear River into the Atlantic Ocean. Just a couple of items of note. Um, when you look at this particular map, uh, to the north-northeast, we're talking about a wind fetch of about two, and a, two to two and a half miles. And to the south-southeast, we're talking about a fetch of four to five miles. Just to give you an idea of some of the wave energy that I'll be speaking with here, in addition to the waves um, generated by ships passing by the shore. So the site is a pre-revolutionary war site it was founded by the British in 1726. As you see here with the little lines off the coast there, there's a steep drop off into the Cape Fear River, which corresponds to why the site was selected as a first colonial site in the Cape Fear River region. These natural drop offs make a great wharf. So they had five of those here. The site was raised by the British in 1776 in efforts to squash the American Revolutionary War and was never rebuilt. Some of the items of significant historical uh, documentation of the site includes these wharfs. Like I mentioned, there was five of them. Um, these are all wooden crib wharfs with ballast stone from England that was placed there in order to secure the site. What's unique about the site is that each of these wharfs corresponds to ballast stone from a unique port in England. So therefore, when they were bringing the, the ships over to collect the goods, the ships from the ballast that were loaded with ballast stone and they would be loaded, unloaded there and so they remained there, and they were captured in these wooden, wooden um, wharfs, as you see here, laid out. Some of these wharfs would extend 180 feet out into the Cape Fear River. It was a unique Lincoln Log approach. And so basically here just gives you a visual of what, it was, what I mean by Lincoln Log. They were pieced together. Um, the lower two timbers there were hewn, and then connected together, middle section and the top section. So what it looked like when they found it at the site. This gives you an idea of the wooden logs that were connected together uh, as they were notched together. A contrast the circular ones up top with the hewn ones at the very bottom. Some other unique archaeological and historic features here include this leather shoe that was found on the site in the mud of the marsh here. It's about 10, 10 inches in length. There's also these historic caps or hats that were found in the marsh there in February 2014. 
Another interesting, unique artifact that was found here are buttons corresponding with the, with the Spanish fleet as there was a skirmish here in the 1740s off the coast of Brunswick Town, Port Anderson. So as I mentioned to you previously, the British raised the site in 1776 and their efforts to squash the American Revolutionary War was basically unsettled um, until 1862. And that corresponds to a year after the start of the American Civil War. And this is located in the south of the Confederacy of the United States. This is one of several fortifications called um, Fort Anderson, located along the Cape Fear River. And the area that was threatened the most by the wave energy was Embankment A, which we'll get into more in just a minute. So the current site manager came on board in 2008. He started noticing changes at the site. The site changes were attributed to the shipping channel that was dredged in 2006 down to a depth of 42 feet from a previous depth of about 35 feet. So they lowered it seven feet in order to get these larger ships going into the port of Wilmington, North Carolina. And as you see here from these photos, uh, going from left to top right, the changes that are going on, on the shoreline there, exposing the artifacts that you see in the bottom, and it included also a geodetic survey marker that was exposed that no one knew was there. So what was going on at the site? Why were the changes occurring? The site, primarily the site reason, excuse me, primarily the site changes were a result of the ships, the vessel drainer wakes from, they're going in and out of the port of Wilmington, North Carolina. As you see from the left-hand side of this photo, we're about 600 feet in some areas from these ships, the closest areas, which is corresponding to phase 3A, 3B, and 4, or the shoreline protection that we implemented here, and you'll get more information about that in just a minute. So the ships coming um, from the ocean to the port are pushing water um, right against this area. And the ships are pushing it parallel to where you see phase one noted there, the water's parallel. Ships coming out of port are pushing the water directly into phase one, as noted here, and then parallel with phase 3A and 3B and four. Basically these ships suck all the, as they pass the site, they suck the water away from the shoreline and then after it goes by, you see in the bottom left-hand side there, the wave energy is generated, comes crashing to the shore, and so therefore we have these marsh escarpments, which are washing away the marsh. So between um, 2008 and 2013, in the red and white striped areas there, we had anywhere between 75 to 120 feet of shoreline erosion. Um, and they have since been even more erosion at the site in some areas because they changed the turning basin. So now we have even larger ships coming into the port of Wilmington, North Carolina. And that is, once again, after the site seemed to stabilize in 2017, when I came on board, things started to, to turn for the bad again in some areas uh, back in 2020 after the ship improvements in the port of Wilmington. The original plan and concept here was to put in a traditional breakwater structure. However, the state of North Carolina had some concerns about putting such a structure, such a structure in, um, as we'll see in just a minute. One is the horizontal nature of the um, breakwater structures. There was ongoing maintenance of the structures the state of North Carolina had concern about, as well as the adaptation for sea level rise. So the state of North Carolina hired a local, had an engineer to come up with an alternate out of the box solution here. One night he was watching a TV show called Reef Langers on uh, the National Weather Service Channel in North Carolina, and he saw a marine contractor who had put in this unique pile-based stabilization mechanism and down in Florida. And so he took it upon himself to present this idea to the state, and then within two weeks later, he went down to Florida to meet with the marine contractor about maybe able to bring this product back to North Carolina and use it here. So the American Atlantic Reef Maker product is a pile-based wave attenuation system, and sorry, I don't have a pointer to point some of these unique features out, but you see the pile there underneath the mechanical support system. So what's unique about it is we can set the structure above the substrate, which allows for modal species that are substrate bound to move from open water to shore, as well as from shore back out into open water. We turn these incoming waves that are breaking into rolling waves. And as a result of that, as it goes through the concrete disc called eco disc, we're seeing accretion on the shoreline. So basically the wave energy is coming through the system and sediment and system, water column is dropping out. And we're seeing a proliferation of marsh grass now because it's not just holding on for dear life anymore. 
it can actually produce and move and expand out naturally. Another image to the left here shows it as a pile-based wave attenuation system turning these breaking waves into rolling waves. So we can, with this pile-based system, it is modular constructed, and so we can set the number of disks corresponding to whatever the wave, the name, wave dynamics are and the engineering specifications for a particular project for wave attenuation. How does the system work? And that is noted on the right-hand side of this image. And these are the octagonal structures and wave energy dissipation as you see on the left-hand side, uh, this diagram, the water is going to bounce back out into the open water. And I'll show you a video here in just a minute that dis dis displays that action. We also have wave collisions here between the sides of the octagonal eco disk. And the third way is that wave energy is directed to the pile itself. As you see in the inset here um, with the legs, direct the water to the pile where the water becomes focused over time. As it goes through this system, on the back side, the legs open back out again. So you go from focused and concentrated area of water energy to unfocused, unconcentrated area, and that's what causes the wave energy to drop. It is a product that is scalable to the wave environment. To date, we've implemented it in several high energy wave environments in North Carolina and one low energy wave environment. Uh, we can make the porosity variable. What I mean by that is we can control how much water flows through these concrete disks. And basically we control how much water flows through the disk system by how close the, the pile and the paddle leg are. So basically a 20% porous structure is there's a gap is noted in the bottom right hand side of this image. And with the 0% porous structure, the pile and the paddle or the leg are basically abutting one another. We've used two different shapes to date, square and octagonal, and they both have different wave attenuation capabilities and influences. And finally, one of the unique, unique, one of the unique features of the product is we're using fiberglass rebar here instead of metal. One of the biggest reasons for that was the uh, stability of cost. Because back when 2018, 2019 time period, um, there are lots of changes um, with the metal in the United States. So we went with fiberglass because we get a more consistent cost. The other one is in terms of longevity. Using fiberglass rebar means the, pro the concrete's not gonna chip and break over time. The fiberglass rebar is consistent in its shape, more so than metal. The metal rebars shrink and swell over, depending upon the heat and the coolness of it. So therefore, that's where you get your chipping. The fiberglass rebar, we don't have that same concern anymore. So I wanted to address the horizontal challenges I mentioned previously. This was, um, the phase one area was a great location to put a traditional breakwater system in. But you see on the right hand side, there was no area at the Roger Moore Wharf to put in a traditional break, rock breakwater system. So this is where it was ideal location for the reef maker system. Um, if you try to put in that rock breakwater structure, you would have had um, ongoing maintenance challenges of rock rolling from the structure down to the Cape Fear River, as you see with the depth going down to, to 40 feet and how quickly that drop off is. We went and covered over the Lincoln Log wharfs that were there, as well as covered over a bunch of marsh as well and the artifacts. So those were the concerns that they had and why the reef maker structure was chosen for this particular project. Some other reasons um, as we get to here is that, uh, as you'll see in the video, how well it works in horizontally limited areas with the destructive wave energy. Habitat, which we'll get more into some images here in just a minute for sessile metal species. Um, mentioned, the wild, mentioned the species be able to move from open water to shore. And basically we're setting the substructure above the substrate. So therefore we can get sand movement underneath the structure as well, uh, instead of cutting the sand off from open water to shore. And sand can also move along the shoreline as well because we're not cutting it off. Other things to keep in mind while we selected the product was the minimization of the footprint. footprint. Um, when you think of a traditional rock breakwater structure, 500 feet in length, you're looking at over 10,000 square feet of the substrate that's going to be impacted there. With our particular product, we've been able to work with the regulatory agencies to justify that we're talking about just the impact being the pile itself, which is 12 inch fiberglass piling. So instead of 10,000 square feet for a 500 foot long structure being generous with two to one slopes, um, a 500 foot long structure land reef maker only has 100 piles in essence, so 78.5. So it's a great um, contrast there, the substrate and impacts. Um, it does allow for flushing up and on the shoreline. It's a moderate constructed, which goes into the last point, which good, you guys can see, I can't, is it accommodates uh, modular construction, accommodates very easily adjusted for sea level rise. 
So what I mean by that is that we can either plan in advance to have the pile extra high, another foot in height, and add another disc once you have a concern about the water level rising to handle storm surge and wave energy. Or we can go in and put a 10 inch pile instead of the 12 inch pile and add another disc on top. Therefore, there's no additional environmental permits that are required in order to enact this particular uh, modification. Whereas if you think of a traditional breakwater structure, whenever you go higher, you have to go wider. So therefore in the United States, you have to get another round of authorizations and maybe have to do additional um, what's called compensatory, compensatory mitigation and making up for those substrate impacts. So now I'm gonna show you a video of the structure. This video was taken in December, 2017, five months after construction. As you see, this is a large ship coming out of the port of Wilmington, North Carolina. We're gonna be showing you how well the system allows the flushing effect to go through. Um, you see in this structure, in this image, we've already got some accretion on the shoreline there. And it's kind of a triangle from the bottom to the top because that's where the sediment was pushed further up river and then trained again from ships going into the port of Wilmington, North Carolina. You'll see this wave energy coming from the top right hand side and start to flow through the system. You see it now start to flow through. And um, what you'll notice here in just a minute is that these are the square discs. So it's gonna be a direct reflection back out into the open water. As you see here, the wave energy bouncing back out into the open water. In just a minute, um, see a little bit of contrast now between how much sedimentation is occurring behind the structure versus uh, downriver or upriver of the structure. And the drone photographer will um, zoom out in just a minute, really give you contrast. You can also see the wave energy, the rolling waves behind the structure versus the breaking in the uh, top right hand side of the video here. And there, it'll paint up in just a minute. You'll see the sedimentation coming off the marsh. So here's another video that I took. This is um, from April 2018, so about nine months after construction. And you can already see in this particular photo, uh, the accretion on the shoreline there. And um, just give you now, this is from Fetch, how well the structure dissipates that wave energy, turning those breaking waves into rolling waves. So nice and calm it is behind the structure. So this is what the, uh, the site looked like through July, 2021. Another image of a ship coming into the port of Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, we have these different breaks in the system, uh, which is complicit with the environmental regulations there in North Carolina, where they want to break every 100 feet. And that's primarily because of the rock breakwater structures that are put in, and not for our particular structure, but we're still having to comply with those older regulations. You can see Roger Moore's Wharf, where that nice drop-off is there noted. Um, to date, uh, through February 2023, we have implemented over 2,000 feet of shoreline stabilization protection here and restoration and the total site is about a mile length so we still have another 3,000 feet to go but we've got a great start now most of the funding is from grants from the national fish and wildlife foundation as well as national park service and then other grants and um dollars from the north carolina general assembly Talk just briefly about wave attenuation capabilities of the structure. Um, this is a particular study that was done at the site. Um, basically, we had some buoys put out at the site, and it noted that there were um, captured wave energy. The buoys are put on either side of the structure to capture how much wave energy goes through and how much it dissipates through the system. So for all the events, for vessel during wakes, we're looking at almost a 60% wave energy reduction. And for the fetch events, we're looking at almost 80% wave energy reduction. And so we also taken the structure and had it tested at one of the unique uh, labs at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Engineer Research Development Center in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And there's a link there to that particular study. The typical way we've done work to date is to set the structure one foot above ordinary high tide, and that captures 99% of the wave energy events. But this study also goes into the opportunities of what do we put it in different water columns and how the structure would respond accordingly. So now we'll look at some of the ecological betterment that's going on in the structure. This photo was from August, 2018. 
Uh, the North Marsh platform is back on the left, bottom left-hand side, so that's going upriver. And so I established my photo point there in December 2017. I've been taking photos ever since of this particular area to document the changes that were going on here. So this is my original photo point image. Uh, this is from December 2017. You can already see we have accretion on the shoreline here and the Spartana grass. We set the structure extra high here to be two feet above ordinary high tide because um, many engineers want to see how something would not, how it, how it would be tested. And so that's what we did here initially, hoping to get a storm event in 2017. Um, well, we did not, but 2018 was a different year as we'll get into in just a minute. So this is an image a week before Hurricane Florence came ashore. Um, again, we're seeing the accretion here. We're seeing the marsh grass expand out naturally. Um, because the wave energy dissipated. So Hurricane Florence came through in um, September 2018. We had three days of high tide storm surges there, 70 plus mile an hour storm events. And basically it took three days to get across that area. It went right over the site itself from east to west. So this is an image uh, video of what it looked like down in Southport, North Carolina, which is about 10, river, 10 miles downriver from Brunswick Town Financial. Give you an idea of the storm surge that was going on here, which is probably nothing new to everybody, but always helps refresh our memories on it. So it took me another five weeks after the storm event to get down to the site. And I was very anxious to get down there because I was wanting to see what happened to the sediment, what happened to the marsh grass, what happened to the structure itself. And basically, long story short, everything looked great. Uh, if you were to take the two images and compare them, there's really no change whatsoever in the marsh grass or the sediment created area or the structure itself. Keep in mind, the structure is under 10 feet of water at one point in time in the storm event. That gives you an idea of the storm surge that was experienced there. Um, and it was flooded for several weeks upon end and no damage to the structure. This is what the site looked like in um, August 2022. Uh, again, see more accretion going on here and see the marsh grass again continuing to expand because of the um, wave energy dissipated. So enough of the pretty pictures. A lot of people here are scientists and want to see what the data looks like. And so that's what we've done. We've actually collected some survey data at the site to see how the accretion is changing. So we're going to start at cross section G here and work our way down river and look at a couple of the cross sections. As you note here, cross section G is an area where there is no structure. And we'll move down to the structure cross section phase one and phase two. So what are we seeing here in this cross section? We're seeing two feet of accretion here which is pretty astonishing over a four year period. One of the reasons why we have so much accretion up river here is because the sediment was entrained from those ships coming into port. It was uh, reactivating the sediment, pushing it up. Fortunately, we were having it captured by the marsh, north, more than the marsh platform, so we could be able to capture this data to see what positive changes are going on here. Behind cross section C, which is in phase one area, What's unique is that we do have C2 feet of shoreline accretion here, but what stands out from other wave attenuation products that are competitors here is that we're seeing two feet of accretion on the, on the water side of the structure. And so that is unique. Most of the time these structures, we see um, scour on the waterfront side from the waves that are coming in with our particular structure, we're seeing that accretion. And so there's positives and negatives associated with that, um, but that's a great unique feature here for us. Cross section F, which is located behind phase two, we've got one and a half feet of accretion on the shore side of the structure and one foot of accretion on the water side of the structure. So other thoughts about the ecological betterment here. Um, this is the furthest point north for oyster recruitment. There has been no oysters recruited here at this particular location until the structure was put in. Um, all the, the, the work to be able to deepen the harbor access has resulted in a nice salt wedge um, moving upriver. And so this gives us great opportunities to collect the oyster recruitment here and also habitat for other um, species like grouper, which are predator fish and people love to fish in North Carolina. Um, in terms of societal benefit, what are we looking at here? Uh, we're seeing the shoreline being rebuilt naturally. The system is taking the sediment out of the water column and deposit on the shore there. So therefore, like the Roger Moore's Wharf now is being covered over as well as the associated um, ballast stone from England. So these artifacts are now being protected. 
And this is the photo from July 2022 time period. And as you can see, the accretion going the shoreline, particularly north there behind the phase one structure. Again, we would look in terms of social betterment, historical betterment. Um, this is a photo of Roger Moore's Wharf in so December 2020 time period. And you see the crane there come along the corner to put in the structure. You see the ballast stone as well as the eroded marsh escarpments here. And this is what the structure looked like last July 2020 time period, 22 time period. The ballast stone has been covered over by the sand as we see the accretion of the shoreline here. And we also see the expansion of the marsh grass as well. Water where now that the wave energy has been dissipated. In terms of economic benefit, what are we thinking? What are we seeing here? Blue crabs have just abounded the site now. That's one of the great observations of the staff at Brunson and Anderson is they've said the blue crab population has just exploded with a wave injury dissipation from the land reef maker structure. Uh, to the point I was out there in July 2020 and I was captured 46 crab pots on the river side of the structure. So that begins to give you an idea of the economic as well as ecological betterment that we're seeing as a result of the structure being put in. Also in terms of economic and ecological uh, fishing, people, local fish in particular, love to come fish off the structure. Uh, the structure provides great habitat, the interstitial space of the eco disc for the bait fish, and then underneath the structure, uh, we have lots of group where they're hanging out underneath there and other predator fish like that. Um, and that's about maybe 500 feet. We had two boats off the coast there shoreline there in July 2022 time period. The so that kind of summarizes everything. Recognized both locally Sorry. and nationally for its significance. I use an old presentation in and so it's kind of coming in on me right now. <laughs> um, I forgot there was a little bit of voiceover for this one that I had to do audio. But uh, just project recognition is a new product. So a lot of people will hesitate to use an engineer structure um, and so one of the things we've been trying to do is to, to put it out there for people like in this presentation here for you all to say, hey, there's new and innovative technologies out there. And we're gathering the data to be able to justify that it's a very good product and can be used. And one of those was uh, the North Carolina Association, American Council of Engineering Companies in 2019 recognized innovation here at this particular site to be able to um, protect the shoreline. Um, it's also included the Engineering Nature Program which uh, is part of, the, part of the green side of the U.S. Corps of Engineers, which are known for uh, manipulating the environment to protect it um, from the national defenses, but that also now there's a green side to it going on. Trying to put ideas in people's minds about ways of working with nature. This was one of 68 projects that was recognized from all over the world and include this particular version of an Atlas Volume 2. And the final word of note is the American Shore Beach Preservation recognized the structure um, and the work here for one of the best restored shorelines in um, August 2021 time period. So then the questions come back to you all. Where do we go from here? And here's just some final thoughts that I have. Um, consider resilient measures that are multiple community benefits, historic resource and ecology that you can use to maximize your project funding. As we noted here throughout this whole conference, dollars are limited. So let's make the most use of our dollars to capture uh, and protect our historic resources, and also think of ways to, um, to capture the ecological benefits that are out there as well, those co-benefits. Uh, consider the adaptability of a plan resilient measures. Don't just think about the presence, but think about how we can adapt in the future. And that's one of the great things that people have an interest in our product is that we can go out there very easily manipulate it with another um, barge, another couple of eco discs to handle that wave energy and the storm surge without additional impacts to the environment. So we already have that plan in mind. And third, consider the landscape and the systems when installing resilient measure to understand as much about the potential benefits as much as the adverse impacts. And so basically, you know, there's always a rigorous process in the United States to implement a new product. And so for us, we had to document as much the positives as out there looking at any sort of the negatives we've had the challenges with. Um, we've had no maintenance of the structure itself, but we have had some things that haven't gone according to plan. Um, but we've always been able to work with the client and the designer to be able to, to make sure the product is moving forward to minimize any adverse effects associated with the product. And with that, I just want to just acknowledge um, the state of North Carolina for their willingness to take a chance on us and implement this new innovative product. 
one of the Sherlock Brothers Foundation, the project engineer who helped with uh, transform their project from the Gulf Coast area to North Carolina and be able to handle the vessel during our wakes. The Marine contractor we work the most with, as well as the research and monitoring team at the UNC Wilmington, who've been out there documenting the changes as much as I have to show the success of the product itself. And with that, I'll turn it over to any questions that anyone may have. You hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, adaptation sometimes means, you know, structural adaptation. And in this particular instance, I think I was struck because the State Historic Preservation Officer in North Carolina promoted this project and basically said it meets the requirements we have to protect, if not to actually bring back elements, protect the archaeological features on the site. That was what was significantly eroding away. And so I, I was very impressed by the fact that we had a tool that was adaptable and there was a biologist that was working on it, okay? So that whole natural cultural heritage tie uh, is happening there. And um, I guess one of the questions I would have, and again, I was struck by the fact that you work so closely with the partnership with the Department of Natural Resources as well as uh, the Historic Preservation Office in the state to customize this. And I think, you know, sometimes we think about seawalls and we think about these systems that get put in, but this was something that even the little disks were customized because as I recall, originally there weren't the jutting rocks off the top. I mean, really, it was customized for that location. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that you were thinking about the natural environment. Can you yes, address that? Yeah, we do have rocks that are included in there to help provide friction um, for the water. And so what we've learned is we started thinking about cost, and that's why we went with uh, went from the square ones originally to the octagonal shaped ones. Um, we get a little different wave energy attenuation with those, but we're also thinking about the bigger picture in terms of cost. And so um, we've also been able to adapt it as well. Uh, the structure, some of the areas go seven feet uh, of structure, and some of them are six feet of structure, so we are able to adjust things very easily. Um, based on the wave conditions and the elevations that we're putting the structure in. Does that answer your question, Lisa? I think I got to it. Yeah. I have a question, Jay. Philip. Yes. Um, interesting. Very, very interesting technology and ideas. I'm most interested, though, in your piling systems. Your piling yes, systems sir. must be extremely deep. Uh, and, and, of course, what I'm concerned about is that it's going to be very environmentally specific where you could put these. You can't yeah, put them anywhere. You, if you've got rock bottoms and, and cliff edges, then you've got a difficulty there. And the other thing with the pilings I was a little concerned about is, yes, you're protecting one heritage site that you've identified, but by putting all these pilings in, are you doing archaeological impact before you put them in? Because you could be indeed hitting other archaeological sites where you're putting them in. Sure, be glad to address both those. Um, yes, the depth of the piling is based on the substrate into which would be dropped, the piles are driven. So um, it's also dependent upon the number of discs that we stack up as well. So those are the two, two driving factors because um, I'm a child of the 70s and the weeble wobbles don't fall down, right? <laughs> so we want to be able to make sure the discs are upright and are attenuating the wave energy and not weeble wobbling like this. So that is a, we want to achieve what's called, in engineering speak, it's called the axial and lateral stability. So therefore, we need to know the substrate that we're driving the pile into. If it's sand, it's a little easier and not nearly as deep as opposed to the muck challenges and clay challenges we had here at this particular site. Um, we're also using hollow piles, so it is a little easier to drive those piles as opposed to a solid pile, so you're not having to displace the material and cause even more environmental damage. Um, does that, I think that answers your first question there. Um, the second part in terms of archaeology, we did, the site manager here did work with us about where we were installing the pile itself. Um, we did have some challenges in one particular area because we were having to drive through ballast stone, so we had to change out and use steel piles. Um, granted, he was fine with that. He understood the environmental constraints we're working in um, because some of the drop-offs there, in particular 3B, were very challenging. It was all ballast stone. We were destroying the the piling by trying to drive in those particular areas. So there is a little bit of a give and take. Um, fortunately, with our particular product as opposed to a traditional breakwater system, 
you know, that traditional breakwater system would have a 50 foot base to it. So you can begin to imagine the environmental impact associated with that, including archaeology, versus ours just being a, being a pile, being just the pile itself. And as you saw here, we're also uh, have accretion going on, so therefore we're covering back over those archaeological resources there. So you're not going to be uh, poached by venturesome people that want to collect them um, and be hidden again underneath the, underneath the accreted material. Hi. Um, I had one question. Yes, ma'am. You briefly mentioned um, the recruitment of oysters onto the surface. I was just wondering how significant it is, because I know you listed that as one of the benefits of having the ecodisks. Yes, ma'am. Because of the, a lot of the interstitial space associated with the ecodisks there, we're getting great recruitment. Um, it's great from a water quality feature, because that, the oysters and other cessile life help improve the water quality for they filter everything through. Um, and we do see potential applications from coral. It's just a matter of trying to find the right opportunity and partner to team with to be able to put something in to be able to attenuate those waves in the marine environment and also work with the coral as well. Does that answer your question? Any online questions? Yes. One more then. Hello, my question is quite simple. What is the cost? What is the cost? Yes. That's everyone's favorite question. Um, I was hoping to get through without having to answer that one. Um, generally speaking, like I mentioned to Jay's question earlier, um, it's all about the number of discs we stack up and the length of the pile of material we're driving into. So if I know those things, I can help, help, help people with a um, rough order to the cost. Generally speaking, the rule of thumb is that we're about the same price compet competitiveness with the rock breakwater structure. This four to five feet in, in height, basically from the substrate to the top of the crest. Granted, that's been our traditional approach at this particular site is we set the, the structure one foot above ordinary high tide like your typical breakwater. One of the things that we're interested in doing is to be able to reduce some of the cost by having it lower in the water column to just knock the wave energy off through the knees of the waves as opposed to going to the very top. Granted, you lose some other wave attenuation capabilities, but that's another interesting, another interesting way maybe to address some issues. So that's four to five feet. It, whatever you generate from a rock perspective with um, a breakwater is very comparable to our particular structure. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to, no, I mean, it's, I know it's hard to, that one was about $2,500 a foot, but that was included engineering. But again, it's with the inflation, I mean, I don't want to give a cost because the, there's so many factors that go into everything these days, right? From a supply chain issue to you just name it. And so that's why I was trying not to give you initially a cost. But here it was about $2,500 a foot, but that was a turnkey design build project where we did the engineering, bathymetry, permitting, and construction. And then um, it doesn't include my time of doing all the monitoring but it does include a little bit of time for UNC Wilmington to do that. Well, thank you for your time and attention, including me. Now I invite Lisa to the podium for the last speaker of the day. Um, I'd also encourage you all, if you haven't uh, stopped at the little table by registration, we have order forms for...